Hey, I'm Debbie, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here, and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. That guy is way too cool for me. So cool. Great to see you today. If you've got a Bible, let's open those up together to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you, you can share with someone that's sitting near to you, or you can take out your smartphone. You can download the River Church app, and there's a Bible feature on there, but I want to encourage you to be seeing and following along with the Word of God yourself. So thankful to be here with you, to be gathering with you. Certainly want to welcome you if you're a guest or if you're watching online. Uh, glad to be together. Matthew chapter 6 in verse number 1. Jesus says this. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. And here's the key phrase. In order to be seen by them. So it's not that doing righteous deeds in front of people is wrong. What Jesus is warning against, what Jesus is saying beware of, is doing them with the goal of being seen by others. For Jesus says, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So this begins this new section here in what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. So it is a sermon that Jesus preached somewhere along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the crowds were gathered. Some believe it was on a hillside there. And there was an amphitheater that allowed Jesus to project and speak to this massive crowd that was gathered together. And so Jesus warns them. He warns them against a religious show. He, re- he warns them against doing things and kind of just glancing out of the corner of your eye, hoping that people will see them. In our modern culture, it would be doing something, taking a selfie doing it, and posting it on Instagram. That would be the warning that Jesus is giving. Hey, listen, if you're doing things to be seen by others, know that that and that alone is the reward that you will get. By looking for the approval and the reward of the crowd, you will forfeit the reward that your heavenly Father would have had for you. So the first example Jesus gives is in verse 2, down to verse number 4, and it is the warning against giving as, uh, as a show or as a hypocrite, an actor, and using those in poverty as kind of your prop in this pretend play there. But verse 5, Jesus gives a second example of this warning, and it concerns prayer. Verse 5, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When Jesus begins this section on prayer, and I'm looking forward to the next few weeks as we look at this teaching on prayer, and then in a couple weeks we'll look at the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus begins with this phrase in verse 5, and when you pray. The assumption is you will pray. As God's people, we're going to be in communion or fellowship or conversation with our Heavenly Father. Martin Luther says it this way, to be a Christian without prayer is not more possible than to be alive without breathing. One author in in, in connection to that says, prayer is something essential to our existence. Prayer is breathing. To a believer, to be in prayer, to be in communion, connection, conversation with our Heavenly Father is the same need that we as humans have for uh, air to enter our lungs, for oxygen to spread through our, our bodies. A believer needs to be in prayer. But like giving, the hypocrites, the religious pretenders, had corrupted prayer. 
A hypocrite, again, means an actor. It meant someone that wore a mask, someone who played a part, someone who pretended. Look at verse 5 again. Jesus says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, the actors, the pretenders, for they love. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues. Now, the synagogue was central to the life of a Jew. It was the place where worship would happen, but it was also served as kind of a community center. And so Jesus is saying of the religious actors, they love to be the ones assigned or they love to be the ones called on to pray in the synagogues. Kind of put it in our modern church culture. The church is gathered together and the pastor calls your name to pray. Now, some of you would faint just dead in the aisle if you were called to pray out loud in front of people. And so we're going to do that at the end of the gathering today, uh, just as a pop quiz. No, we will not do that. But, but imagine, you know, you are that, that hypocrite, that pretender, that actor who when your name gets called, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to blow their minds. Ah. Sovereign Lord of heaven. Like, there's nothing wrong with calling God sovereign Lord of heaven, but sometimes when people pray, you know they're not talking to God. They're giving a speech with the biggest words they can string together, and your head is exploding with the vocabulary that's being used, and so the assumption is that person knows his stuff. That's a prayer person right there. Jesus is saying, don't be like that. Don't be a pretender an actor who loves to be called on because the moment they're called on, they will turn prayer into part of their show. They will stand and pray in the synagogues, and not just in the synagogues, but in the street corners or at the street corners. Now, what's interesting, this word in the Greek is like a, it's like a wide street corner. This is a place of a lot of traffic, so this is a public place for a public performance. Now, we know from the book of Acts, in Acts chapter number three, at three o'clock in the afternoon was what was known as an hour of prayer. And so at the temple, the, the horns would sound, the trumpets would sound, and that would signify for people that the, the time of prayer was beginning. So some people, the horns would play, and they would stop what they were doing, and they would pray. Nothing wrong with that. It's a designated time to pray. Then maybe people stopped in their shops, or maybe people stopped by walking, gathered their wives together, gathered kids together, gathered a friend together. Hey, can we pray together? Let's just, let's just spend some time thanking God. Let, let's some, spend some time acknowledging who God is. Let's, let's just adore him for a moment. Let's confess our sins to him. Let's thank him for some things. But others, the horns would sound, <clears throat> and they would begin they would begin their performance of prayer. Jesus gives a parable that kind of gives us some insight into what that prayer may have sounded like. In Luke chapter number 18, you don't have to turn there, but in Luke chapter number 18, Jesus tells the story, the parable of two people who go up to the temple to pray. The first one was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. So the two extremes of the religious spectrum. One, the Pharisee was very conservative, uh, viewed by people as being very holy, loving God. The other was viewed as a traitor, as a, as a greedy, dirty person. Jesus says the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. Here was the Pharisee's prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, period. I want you to just hear that prayer. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. These losers around here, this tax collector, the adulterers, the unjust, 
God, I don't know if you notice this or not, but I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I have. And I just kind of put in that note right there at the end of verse 12, God, you're so lucky to have me. That was the prayer. So you can imagine Jesus here in Matthew chapter six teaching and saying, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, the pretenders. They love to find the most public place to pray. They love when their name gets called in the synagogue because they're like, oh, I've been preparing for this. I got some words. No one knows what they're gonna mean. Loves the street corners, and man, do they put on a performance. But it's all about the ears of people around them. Fundamentally, it's not even prayer. It's not communion with God, it's not fellowship with God, it's not a conversation with God, it's not a connection with God. Their eyes might be closed, their hands might be raised, they're standing, they're kneeling, whatever the particular posture might be, but they're doing it with just kind of one eye open a little bit to see the faces of awe around them. God, as I stand here on this street corner, With all of these sinners, Lord, you're lucky to have me. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to pray super loud, Lord. And I'm going to use big, theologically profound words so no one around here knows what I'm saying, but they'll be impressed. Guess who's not listening? God. the one that prayer is intended to be directed to. Jesus said, don't pray like that. He said, truly I say to you, they have received, the end of verse five, their reward. The same with giving. Later on in the, pa- later on in the chapter in verse 16 down to verse 18, the same with fasting is the same now with praying What they want is they want the approval and praise of people. So what do they give for? They give so people will see it, not so the needs of the poor will be met, not out of a heart of gratitude to the Lord that overflows in generosity. They give because they want the crowds to see it. And then, think about this, they're praying so that people will hear it. They're praying in a way that people, hoping that people will be impressed. Jesus says, don't pray like that. Verse six. Jesus says, but when you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Now, Jesus is not speaking against public prayer, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but Jesus is making a very clear contrast. You have those who love to pray in public, but it's not about praying to God in public. It is about being seen in public praying. It's about impressing people, whether in the synagogue or on the street corner. Jesus says to his people, when you pray, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into your room and shut the door. Now, houses were substantially different here at this time in in Israel, in Palestine. And so you're you're talking a, a mud hut, a mud brick hut. There was usually only one room inside that could be locked. And that's where things would be kept that would be safe. This is the room Jesus is talking about. He's talking about about going into your inner room, sometimes the inner chamber would be translated, or your closet. It's talking about going to the inner place and shutting the door so that no one can see or no one can hear. Imagine taking this, okay, I'm supposed to go inside my house, but I really want people to hear me praying. I'm going to leave the door open. Dear Lord, I want my neighbors to hear this. He says, go in, shut the door. And Jesus says, and pray to your father who is in secret. What does this mean? 
prayer begins as a private place. Practically, what this means is it means you and I setting time aside with no distractions. It means a time where we're focused on the Lord. For some, that means putting the phone away. It means probably not while we're driving. If you got little kids, it probably means getting up early. But it's saying, Lord, I'm going to go to this spot. And it may not just be a a physical spot. You may not have to have a room in your house. But it's a spot where the, the TV is off, the phone is away, You're not working through the to-do list for the day. You're saying, Lord, I'm just going to spend this time with you in secret. This is a private, personal time with you. That's when prayer begins to be real. That's when, when our conversation, our relationship with the Lord really begins to be raw. A few weeks ago, I won't get into all the details, not even in my notes, but a few weeks ago, I went through one of the worst church meetings I've ever been part of in my life. And I've shared some of it with you or some of my friends. It was, it was a nightmare. I got called all kinds of interesting names I've never been called before, uh, like essentially like Christian cuss words. That's what I got called. And uh, so I got called all kinds of terrible things. And uh, the next day, I was supposed to go on my summer sabbatical. But I had been through this two and a half hour, three hour meeting where I just was, felt like I got punched over and over and over again. And so all week, I was struggling. I usually, when I rest, when, when I, I, I usually have no problems doing two things in my life, sleeping and eating. It's clear I had no problems eating, you know. But I have no problem sleeping. I can sleep fine, and I can eat just fine. Some people, when they get stressed, they lose their appetite. I just go for Frosties. And uh, so, you know, like, I have no problems with that. But that week, I was rocked. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night stressed, emotional. And, and it was really raw between me and the Lord for days. Like, Lord, please make that worth it. That was awful. God, why, what, what is going on here? And I, and I kept having to pray what First Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so communion with God for me in that moment in my life was giving something to God and not taking it back. I think sometimes with our cares and our concerns, we like to play show and tell with God. Here, God, I'm going to show it to you. Here, God, I'm going to tell you about it. But God, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to give it to you. And it was days because I'm such a self-reliant, prideful jerk face that I would be like, God, this really is terrible. I'll figure it out. I would take it back instead of saying, Lord, here it is. this, This is stressing me out. This is causing me sleepless nights, pain. Like, Lord, I, I'm going to give this to you. And I'd, I'd go to sleep and I'd have dreams about it and wake up and say, no, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I cast this care upon you. You care for me. It was very raw. So what Jesus is encouraging with us and our heavenly father is a real, authentic, at times raw, emotional time with our Heavenly Father where it doesn't begin with dear Jesus and end with in Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes it is, Lord, I don't know what to say to you. I'm confused. I'm frustrated. This is not what I wanted. You say, I don't know if we're allowed to talk to God like that. Then you need to read the Psalms. And you see the psalmist saying, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Have you forgotten that I exist? 
And we bring those to the Lord because we trust that he's big enough and he's strong enough and he's merciful enough and he's caring enough when we come to him with just our brokenness. The religious hypocrites miss out on that. And I think for me and I think for some of you, we miss out on communion, fellowship, connection with our Heavenly Father because we're so worried about impressing people with our prayers or sounding just right. Jesus said, don't be like that. He said, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. The NIV translates that, pray to your Father who is unseen. One commentator said, he himself is invisible, meaning God, in stark contrast to his pretended worshipers who were all too visible. Look at what the passage says, and I love how the scripture works this. Pray to your Father who's in secret, or again, the NIV, who is unseen, and your Father who sees. Who sees. So there's, there's beautiful promises like built in here, baked into this passage of scripture that's so wonderful. We go into that private place of prayer and guess who is there present with us? The Lord. No one else sees, but he sees. And so we pray, Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So Lord, I just, I bring it all here. I dump it all here because you see it all anyways. And here's the wonderful part. He's present with us in that moment. So here's the, the, the contrast that, that Jesus is laying out. We can pray, put that in quotes, to be seen by others, or we can pray to be seen by our Heavenly Father. Think about that. Where's the power? And I think that's what Jesus is getting at here in that last phrase in verse six. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I think part of the reward of that private prayer time with Jesus, prayer, private prayer time with our Heavenly Father is real spiritual power. So here's, I mean, I can alliterate all this, but I'll try not to be ridiculous. We can have performance in front of people or we can have real spiritual power. That's what Jesus is laying out here. Hold your spot in Matthew 6 and go to the right. Go to Matthew 26. We're going to go to Jesus' private place of prayer. Verse 36, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And we know from Luke and John that this was a, a, a pretty regular place um, John says it this way in John 18, too. He says, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So they headed to Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus says, stay awake with me. Look at the... Look at the vulnerability we see from the Lord. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed. He prayed, my father, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said, Peter... So could you not watch with me one hour? You, you couldn't pray for an hour? You said earlier in the night you would die for me, you would go to death with me, but you can't stay awake with me? Verse 41, watch and pray. You may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak again. For the second time he went away and did what? Prayed, my father, if this cannot pass 
Unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for his, their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time. Saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Look at the emotional human contrast between verses 46 and verse 38. In 38, he says, my soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. He prays three times, Father, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Over and over again, he's laboring in prayer with the heavenly Father. Verse 46, he says to the disciples, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Father, if there's any way possible, my soul is sorrowful to death. He goes into prayer and he leaves empowered by time with his heavenly father. You can leave there. Go into the Old Testament. Go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number six. Daniel chapter number six, maybe you'll remember this story from catechism or Sunday school or VBS or something along those lines, or maybe this is your first time hearing this story. It's the story of a man, an Old Testament prophet named Daniel, who has survived massive upheavals in kingdoms. First, he's part of the Babylonian Empire, and now he finds himself as part of the, the Persian, the Medio Persian Empire. And people know that he is a faithful man. In verse number four, no error or fault was found in him. And so they wanted to trap him. And they decided to make a law that you couldn't petition any other God or man but the king for 30 days. Look down at verse 10, Daniel chapter six and verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he knew the law was signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Look at the passage. As he had done previously. As he had done previously. Jesus Sorrowful to the point of death, goes and spends time with his heavenly father, stands, rise, and Hebrews would say, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What do we see in Daniel? A human being just like you and I. We see Daniel in circumstances that are, he's facing persecution. And what is his strength? Three times a day, he goes to that upper chamber, opens the windows towards Jerusalem, and he begins to pray. They arrest him. They throw him in a den full of lions. Years ago, my friends and I, we stood in uh, Dr. Charles Stanley's study. And... Stanley had in his study a, a painting I had never seen before. I had heard it described, but it's a painting that a lady gave to him early in his ministry. And it's Daniel in a way that I had never imagined him before. And it's Daniel with his back towards the lions. And the story in Daniel chapter 6 is that Daniel is thrown there as a death sentence. And God, by his miraculous power, shuts the mouths of the lions and preserves Daniel from death. How could a guy go into the den of lions and maybe that's how he stood with his back towards those beasts? How could he do that? He was sustained by power in prayer. One author I read yesterday said, Prayer, prayers are our roots. The roots do the hard work of strengthening the tree, but this hard work is hidden work. So again, the Lord is not forbidding public prayer. He's just saying God and God alone should be who we are talking to. I would say it this way. Our public prayer will be rooted and informed and shaped, validated. It will be genuine based upon our private prayers.
Writer Don Carson, D.A. Carson, says it this way, we will comprehend Jesus' point better if we each ask ourselves these questions. Do I pray more frequently and more fervently when alone with God than I do in public? Do I love the secret place of prayer? Is my public praying simply the overflow of my private praying? Because here's what Jesus is saying. Go back to Matthew 6. First word, chapter 6, verse 1. Beware. Beware of what? Beware that this might be all a show. You want to know how it's not, how you know, one of the ways you know it's not a show? You love the private place of prayer. Spending time with your heavenly father matters. As I was studying this, it's a huge challenge to me. I can feel the Lord saying to me, Josh, do you like to talk about prayer or do you actually like to pray? What's in question is do we have a real personal relationship with the Lord? One of the indicators of that will be a real love for time, prayer with the Lord. And maybe you're sitting here saying, that's not me. We all fail, we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. And that is why we sang it a moment ago, I love it, we sing Christ alone. See, Christ made it possible for us to speak to our Heavenly Father. Christ made it possible for us to be restored in right relationship with our Heavenly Father through his work on the cross. So Jesus did what? Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. What, what kind of sins? Um, our phoniness. Our acting are pretending that we're talking to God when out of the corner of our eye we're hoping people hear us and are impressed. Those sins. Those sins of falsifying a conversation with God, pretending. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and Jesus rose from the dead. And we must run to him. We run to him in repentance, meaning we turn from sin. We turn to those things that we've relied on. We, or we run from fake religion or a fake relationship and we race to Jesus and we say, I'm a mess. I can lie to myself and not just myself, but I lie to other people. I play games. I'm deceived. Romans 10, 9, I confess you as Lord. I believe in my heart that you did die, that you were raised from the dead. The Bible says if we do that, we are saved. That is when we are rescued from our hypocrisy, from the act. The Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of us and begins to transform our hearts that do what? That look for the approval of people and we begin to live for the approval of the Lord. With giving, Jesus is asking are you giving to bless or are you giving to impress? With prayer, Jesus is asking, who are you talking to? My prayer for each of us is that it will be the Lord. Let's pray together.